Um, our first, oh, uh, welcome to the DNI um, working group meeting. This is May 13th of 2020, and six minutes after the hour. So, um, our first order of business today is to find the facilitator for next week. Do we have any volunteers? I will, so always, I will always serve as a backup, but, <laughs> um, and I, I will say facilitating is, it's really just kind of shepherding the conversation, so anybody can do it. So, um, we, I think, Matt, you might have to fall, we might have to fall back to you on this one. Sure. I'm always happy to do it. Okay. Uh, and if we find anyone, if anyone else would like to step up between that time, then you can definitely take over for that. Cool. Um, so last week um, for the next topic, um, we had a check uh, an inclusive leadership um, metric that Emma had put into a pull request. And we're looking at, um, I was wanted to ask if the doc had been created for that yet and what that would look like. I don't don't remember. Um, that may be something at the table for next week. So, um, well, hold on a second. So files changed. Uh, let me see if I made a doc really fast. Okay. Um, you can continue on, and I'll, we can. Come yeah, I'll, to I'll I'll come back to that one. Okay. Um, so last week. We had some recommendations for DNI badging um, about automation to take score and pull requests, which I think is a great idea. And um, having other ways to issue a PR than using GitHub, um, which is also a great idea. And um, I'll start with the bots. So we haven't had a lot of movement on this since last week, um, but it's something I've been looking at myself. And uh, it wouldn't be. Uh, the hardest thing in the world that might be something that we can do with our with our students asa and Tola specifically asa for this one but uh, i'd have to i'd have to wait for next week to or, or maybe a later week to um get more information on that because it's it would be later in the project for the summer what um, is the request about bots i mean what in the in a dni badging program what could bots yeah, as I understand it, it would be um not necessarily collecting data but um helping manage like a score keep of every project. Um, okay. And then, yeah, if, the, if I got that right. But uh, that's what I was kind of looking into was how to count up values or um, that's kind of related to our other um, recommendation um, that people might be intimidated using GitHub, um, issue a pull request and get the project, uh, get information to the project. Um, we looked at this in our Sunday meeting for badging and yeah. um, Decided it was out of out of scope for the internship projects uh, for Asa and Tula, but we uh, but Sala and I are going to look into that ourselves. Uh, Asa had made uh, you can share this if you want, Asa. But she had made a, um, a little website where you can start a pull request and it would fill out that information. The problem with that that I noticed. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Bring it in. Okay. Um, so it basically, you put in information and it takes it with JavaScript and sends it off to a pre-made pull request using some kind of GitHub API. <clears throat> We've done this as Global Consent Manager past project and um, it was uh, not the hardest thing to do, but it would take maintenance every time it would update and it requires a GitHub login to create the pull request anyway. Um, so we're looking into our other options for that. Um, Sol and I are for that one. Um, sorry, can I chime in quickly? Just yeah, of course. Uh, so yeah, no, uh, I guess what we can do with a query per parameter, like a search query in the URL is open an issue. Uh, what, is, what is proving um, um, more challenging to, um, I guess, um, kind of like um, abstract in a way that is not GitHub intertwined is how do you go about not opening an issue, but rather opening a pull request, which is a commit against a repo that is in the public domain. Um, so, so the idea that you make commits in the public domain, uh, it takes that you fork with your identity, and then it takes that you also um, um, have that 
discussion track before it lands um, and it contributes to the re repository uh, with, with all parties identified for their contribution and their stake. Um, that workflow doesn't happen with a search query and it, it will be very API heavy. Um, so we don't mind learning the API, but we don't want to abstract it in a way that it's like, okay, this works on GitHub. Now we're lost because it won't work elsewhere. Um, so, so this is why we want to give it more time and we want to, um, you know, really layer this up um, so that we can, um, you know, make it transferable um, and make it transparent to the user, I guess. Yeah, well put. There were a couple of questions from Solana in the chat, a comment and a question. So have you done this before, Solana? Um, so one of the things that I've noticed is, you know, if you're talking about actual code, uh, getting outside of the PR process gets gnarly, especially if you're doing anything CI, CD or test nets yeah. or anything along those lines, things get weird. Yeah. Um, but I've noticed for a lot of my people, um, too often we put documentation into a coding style format with the MDs, right? With the markdowns and that's okay. And I get it and I understand why people do it, but it creates a pretty big barrier. Um, in regards to those PRs. And so I find that, you know, you really do have to put the documentation into either a wiki or pages paradigm. So that way the people like get it and they can come in and they don't have this huge barrier. But with PRs, you know, and that's kind of how I'm structuring my stuff um, as much as I can going forward is and they're saying, no, this is the coding pieces and these are the documentation pieces. And, you know, we're gonna have to look at some other assets too that we're gonna start entering into our stuff, right? What am I going to do with graphical assets? What am I going to do with, you know, um, architectural assets? How are those all going to work in regards to the GitLab format? Um, because once again, don't want to do PRs for that. Um, so I, I totally get what you're saying. It's just one of those things as to where I think we need to start being careful about our vocabulary as to what which each of those things mean, you know, PRs, issues, you know, using the wikis or the pages instead and when all that should be done properly. So that's just what I was trying to toss in. Thank you. Yep, can I ask a question on that? Mm -hmm. So um, when you're using pages or the wiki, so let me back up for a second. So part of the, the hope is, is that somebody would issue a request. Okay, mm -hmm. however that request comes in and the request is for a badge for an event, right? And so um, in this scenario, just pretend you would be assigned a reviewer to review what they have proposed in order to receive the badge, you know, so they, I'm the submitter and I say our event should get a DNI badge because we're family friendly, because we have a code of conduct and because we do, you know, we do, we do these things and then you're a reviewer and you're like, no, you don't, you, you don't have a code of conduct. You, you don't have any indication that you're family friendly. So, um, so there's this open and transparent review that somebody like yourself, a, 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 a reviewer would mm -hmm. provide. Um, and the intention is, is that that review process is, is open, completely open and transparent so that if, um, if you as a reviewer are having trouble finding the code of conduct, you can simply mm -hmm. tell me that. Like, oh, sure, you may have it, but you have to you know, explicitly link it off of your conference page. Right. And I would say, oh, super. Thanks for the help. And you're helping me kind of through mm -hmm. this process. So would, would, um, so would pages or a wiki, does it, does it enable that type of conversation? You know Not I mean? as well, honestly. Um, and that's one thing that we've been talking about, you know, um, I don't know if none of y'all know me except a few of you. I work over at IEEE and I'm working on something called um, SA Open, which is a, we're modifying GitLab to address a bunch of open source needs like, well, open source and open standards and open hardware and all these other different things. And one of the things that we've identified at the very beginning is the fact that we need a voting or balloting module um, where we need to be able to have this kind of governance aspect put on it because I watch over and over again people trying to create governance documentation and you need to have that kind of vote. You need to have that kind of guidance that you're talking about, Jerome. And so it's like, how do we start to put some of that in there? And right now what we have doesn't exist okay. from what I've seen. Um, and so that is one of the things that we're prioritizing is working on something like that so okay. that we can actually have that. 
Um, but I, I guess like with those kind of constraints, what you're talking about, then you basically have to fall into a PR and it sucks because then yeah. you're basically working off of this maintainer model again um and it's not a full vote right you know it's not like um you know for us we do a lot of stuff based off of majority and so you have to have like okay. three quarters or something along those lines and you have none of that option you just have someone you know with those permissions okay. says yes yeah um which makes it tougher but yeah no i i i see what you're saying if you need that gating function we do pr is the only way you're going to get that gating way. function yeah. And gating, and um, like gating, meaning like it's developmental gating. That's the whole. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> totally. Well, one weird thing that I did at PayPal that was, you know, it was all internal um, that I did that was kind of interesting is um, I let them give each other emojis and they were specifically tagged emojis so that I could have a bot that goes back later and like looks at it. Um, and when they went and did that, that was like one of the funny things is that they could go in and they can test them um, afterwards. Um, but that wasn't pretty. So, um, and to be quite honest, because everything was so transparent, they gated themselves. So it wasn't a big deal. It's like, dude, that doesn't, uh, uh no way. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. Trans transparency can do that. Can't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it doesn't work once you get over 150, right? And when you get okay. over 150, then you get too many trolls and everybody, because everybody doesn't know everybody. Um, but yeah, no, if you're needing that, then yeah, I get it. Uh, okay. It's unfortunate. But when we start working on it, I'll ping everyone and let them know so y'all can come in and say a bunch of different objects because I really do want it to be a true voting module so that it is like you set what those voting parameters are and, you know, that sort of thing. So it sounds like a really good use case. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And something we've learned from um, working with issues and pull requests specifically, almost in a vacuum sometimes, but uh, we've, we've learned that the issues and pull requests both have their pros and cons as far as like automation or usability goes and all kinds of different situations. So we're still, we're maybe even thinking about moving back to the issue side of things because it works better for what we need, but that's, I guess that's what we have to consider in this situation. Um, so, no, I get that, Matt. I'm with you. Could, I, could I just add one thing? Uh, the reason why we explored uh, PRs, uh, it, I think it stands a little bit beyond. Uh, beyond um, so if we're talking about automation in any sense, um, I believe um, the way it is today that um, um, we, we kind of like have a clear uh, process on how to apply automation on top of something being contributed to the repo itself. Um, with issues, we have like um, bots that moderate issues. Um, and, and I guess if, if we can say, we can have bots in the issue side of things that basically augment the um, uh, code base. Um, and the reason why it has to augment the code base is because you have to tie that into um, static and dynamic content that becomes available as a result of that um, in the on the web, including the fact that your badge uh, would actually be, um, um, you know, um, issued in some form. So, yeah, so, so, so just trying to tie the application process in a workflow that actually results in the badge being visible is, is really where, where it's getting, um, tricky and I, I think we have to explore all, all options uh, until we get the right formula. So, yeah. Thank you, Saul. Yeah, that's super, um, super helpful. So, um, I'm sorry, I just have so many questions based on these yeah. <laughs> Super interesting. Um, can you, if somebody, um, if, 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 I understand, Saul, that you're looking at a variety of options, but if somebody was to to come to the website in in an effort to get a badge um, and the application through the website created an issue i think i'm understanding this so far can can you actually automate an issue such that it makes a contribution to the code base i'm probably not quite saying that right at the end properly there but Obviously, a pull request modifies the code base. That makes sense. But can you do it through an issue? 
Well, it, it would be, um, um, you know, a housekeeping modification, like we're modifying our own code base okay. um, and we're, we're, we're putting in the comments of that um, modification, um, see issue, whatever, and then that is how you do the uh, change. Um, uh, you know, or, or we could also use um, um, meta uh, tagging as in um, co-authored by, and then we can add the author of the issue. So, so there are creative ways where you can do that and, and okay. you would on webhooks or GitHub Actions, I think, are now becoming the standard for GitHub things. Um, so we want a parallel, like we want a non-GitHub parallel of Actions and we want to make sure it ties uh, to the uh, uh, issues or they're parallel elsewhere and gotcha. yeah we can be as abstract or generic as possible okay so it sounds like at this point or at right now um, a lot of you are still talking through what the best possible technical solutions are in this workflow yeah, like generic terms that basically make it possible to transfer this, you know, framework um, across platforms that are used as open source repositories. Right. So, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's completely fair. And um, Asta, the link that you gave was that I didn't, I couldn't get that to work. Oh, never mind. It works. The link? It, it works now. I don't know. Maybe it was. It was. Never mind. <laughs> I retract my comment. Okay. Um, so what is the What is the link that you gave us? I see. So the link that you gave Asta was to launch an issue. Yep. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's a lot of it's like not the easiest thing in the world, but it's definitely um, not a, a lot easier than a lot of other things you can do with JavaScript. <laughs> so then the so, part of the workflow would be to come to a page like this, like what Asta provided fill out a series of questions and whatever those questions might be, you click submit and then it perhaps produces the issue. We are just considering that. Okay. It's not the yeah. final thing yet. No, 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 that's fair. That's cool though. Yeah. And we do appreciate that you made that to start us off. Yeah. So there's uh, there's something I added at the last moment. If we finish with this discussion, um, is there are there any other questions or comments here for Badging? No, I was just talking about how um, we're actually backwards in doing it right now at IEEE because we've got about 15 standards that are coming through the open source portion. And so we're putting it in there and some of the open source coding or data or other different or other different artifacts are part of the actual standard. So um, it's a badge, but it's like the hardest core badge you've ever imagined. <laughs> what's, the, what's, the backwards huh? part, what's the backwards part of it? When you say it's um, that we're doing it all by hand, really, right oh, now. So it's an issue, and then we have labels, and then we're labeling through every single step that matches the actual standards process okay. that they're going through in regards to the standards body. Um, and we're working on right now having an API sync between the standard, the internal standards tool, and our um, open source um, representation as to where that it, where the, that those collateral or standard itself is in in the process gotcha. um but it's like really hard coded right now and we are using issues and we are using labels and it is monitored by staff and there's a whole bunch of different things that happens in regards to that where we have to be hardcore gotcha. um but yeah that's 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 how we're doing it right now is we're being um we're, we're managing it staff wise but that's one of the things we're looking at automating um, just because it, so yeah. it sounds kind of heavyweight right now it is just very heavy yeah, okay. Josh is doing way too much work on it. Um, yeah. But right now, we're also getting through all of our use cases. Thankfully, since we weren't heavy at the beginning, we were able to do things like, oh, you real we realized, oh, data could be part of a standard. That's cool. And so we have that example now, um, which I don't think we would have gotten to had we not been so organic at the beginning. 
Gotcha. Um, you know, so there's some interesting stuff that's happening there in regards to some of the things that are becoming pieces of standards. Right. Um, cool. Yeah. So there was a question for you in the chat. Yeah, oh, I, I'm I, sorry. Because I'm the queen of like taking us on tangents, I'm asking you <laughs> in the chat versus in the um, meeting itself. Because I'm just curious where you're coming from that on Saloon, Sal Salona, because we worked really hard to make them the same. So totally off track. Please answer in the chat so we can go back to their normal um, agenda and I don't disturb the meeting as normal. Um, the only I'm real reason, really Amy, curious. is user experience. We have a lot of much older people that ha are not coders. Um, and since we are doing things like open science and open hardware and a bunch of different groups that aren't used to GitHub um, or GitLab, uh, they don't understand the paradigm and they are only working on documentation. And so it ends up being kind of a significant lift to get them to go in there and do that. And it makes it way too slow and they get really frustrated okay, with the gaining function of a PR. Those differences, you don't have us versus them. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, it's just, it's just one of those things where it's much easier just to have them, you know, I can, I can get them over to a wiki because they're used to Google Docs now, but I can't get them, I mean, I, I'm dealing with people who are used to still dealing with passing around word docs. Yeah, fair enough. So, I was yeah. just curious. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it also, it's just too slow, honestly, when you're first creating a document and if you're doing it via PRs, it's just like, it's really hard to get a group of 30 to collaborate on that and iterate super fast like you would on the Google doc. It's just, it's just too slow. Yeah, and we also use Garrett, which I think is friendlier than PRs. Okay, I'll return the meeting to its normal. <laughs> well, thank you. We, we appreciate your guidance with this also, Solana, um, because experience is very helpful in this situation. Um, so one thing I added at the last second was um, something that I wanted to bring up in the DNI meeting. Um, that issue that I've got hovered over here um, under MIT license on badging. Um, Georg has had recommended that um, we use the MIT license because that's what we use over the chaos project. Uh, I just wanted to bring that up and see uh, what kind of consensus we can have on that. I know that it's pretty straightforward and makes a lot of sense to me at least, but I just wanted to see what other people thought about it before I changed that because it's a big change. So um, what what is licensed here? In this um, Cause like the, nothing, I think nothing's licensed right now. No, 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 but what would actually carry a license? The so, repositories themselves. So have that button that says MIT on the repositories. Is I think is basically just all at. the documentation that's in the repository. Yeah, in the in the organization. I, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's fine. Okay. Uh, if anybody else has any thoughts on that, but I think if anybody else does have anything to say about that, um, you can put in the document or say it here. Uh, it seems like since we use that for all of the other working groups, though, that I understand. Yeah, I mean, I'll um, just say a statement that I've said before. MIT is typically a license I think of as associated with source code. Typically, I think of documentation licensing more around Creative Commons. But MIT does work for documentation. Um, so that is taken care of. And there are less item is to our I mean, second um, to last item. I, I was just going to say one thing too. I just, I did want to congratulate Tola and Asta for, Asta was accepted for a Google Summer of Code to be part of the badging program. So it's official. And Tola was accepted as an outreachy student, uh, also working on the DNI badging program. So it is absolutely wonderful to have both both of you um, participating in this project under both of those really great programs so awesome. thanks a lot yes thanks a lot thanks a lot. Well, sorry matt uh, no problem uh, i'm glad to give them some recognition too um so our next part is review documentation, discoverability, and accessibility metrics. Yeah, this always As, this always moves very fast. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. Um, <laughs> no, it wasn't. It wasn't in anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it looks like um, usability is pretty well understood at this point. So I, that's why I only put in discoverability and accessibility. 
Um, yeah. And we can always go back to usability too, but uh, we have a lot of um, work done on this document and I'm very happy about that. Um, it might be a time to, to start cleaning up and answering the questions that are in the comments themselves. So we have some, some rec recommendations of um, changes that have not been um, updated quite yet. And we have some questions that haven't been answered yet. So that might be a good time to do that too. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the, can I ask a question for people? So this is, um, so for those of you that kind of don't know the history, right? So this was all one metric at one point around documentation, issues of accessibility and discoverability. Um, seem to be confounded on the single metric. So the proposal was to break it out into three metrics. The, the single metric was just very overloaded is what the concern was. Um, and so now here we are with these three metrics. And um, I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that sometimes it's difficult to narratively separate these three. That this is kind of my own, my own take on this. So um, it's just, it's very challenging. And so we are, we, we have three right now. And I guess one of the things that I was asking myself is we had gone from one to three a long time ago. Does, do we still need three? Is it one to two? We seem to be stuck on the number three and it's like an accordion, right? So we, we expanded the first one out really like to three, and then we're trying to bring them to, I don't know. I don't know if this is making any sense, but these are very, very hard to, they're very nuanced to separate out. That's all. And personally, I have a really hard time. Yeah, for anybody that doesn't know how we separated it out in the first place, we took the, um, the different types, like different parts of the original metric and just highlighted them in three different colors. So this is how we split it out. It was very quick. Yeah. Um, can I, can I j jump in because, um, I think I'm kind of like being a little bit tardy and trying to make up for it by um, making a good way to look at the problem. Um, so three, three metrics may be what we end up with. Um, so far, at least one of the three we have clarity on. Um, um, the problem we're running into is how do you divide a pie where you're not really sure what are the pieces or how many people are related to that pie um, and do it in such a way that everyone would know there's another piece of the pie that they didn't look at that they might need to look at and where, where, where to find it. So, so you, you're, you're trying to take one, one big problem, documentation, and you're trying to divide it in such a way so that people would know where to look if they had not looked. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, well said. I think the pie metaphor was was good. <laughs> yeah. So so um, you know um, it it boils down to agreeing on terminology, um, and you know w w once you have to um, agree on many terminologies, the best way you can do it is to try to make a mind map of that, so that people would say would see how they relate. Um, and they would uh, kind of have a very brief description of each to be able to differentiate them. Um, and once you agree on that, then, then you have like roughly enough to know this is a pie. Um, we don't have that yet. Um, and I think what we've been doing is we've been trying to kind of imagine where the pie would, would you know, finally become visible by, by working on all three together. Um, what I would recommend is either we get the terminology doc sorted out. I don't know how that works out. Um, I've done terminology, uh, you know, very anal, honestly, um, for, for my thesis and for the work I do. Um, but I could tell people, like, here's the terminology, you know, <laughs> just live with it, you know. But w w once you want people to agree on the same terminology, um, it takes time for everyone to appreciate the importance um, of every single uh, piece of that. So that takes time. Um, maybe what we want to do is we want to um, focus on the first one um, and say um, round one is we get the easy part done. 
and when 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 that when that is um, you know fixed, um, and we have time to reflect on what is left, then we can start to uh, to plan our other two parts. So is the recommendation, Sala, with documentation usability, is it to move it into a candidate release metric? Yes, and then when people are like, why is it only that? And, and, and then we'll kind of get a feel on, on what, what, um, what to do about the you know, big tangled mess, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair approach. Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, it's hard to think, you know, team oriented, um, but I think I think that's the strength we have. Like we're a team, so so if we do it that way, uh, we all gradually grow with the, you know, with the complexity of the problem. I guess. Okay. I'm gonna I'm putting in the notes just an action item to move first first of the three, or potentially three. Um, to move documentation usability to um, GitHub as a PR. Hello? Yeah. What's up? I'm just working on some software engineering. What's up? Uh, hold on, Colin. You're on, not on mute. You mute, Colin. Okay, Colin is now muted. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I wonder how everybody feels if when we move documentation usability, we would say that, you know, this is one of three or more or less, I don't know, one of more than one part of documentation. Yeah. Um, um, and um, you can see more on the ongoing progress here. And then, you know, just bring people to the party. Uh, so they would be like, okay, I understand now there's more to it. Um, it's messy. Yeah, no, that, it's, I think that's a good idea. And the beauty is it, it would get rid of one of the three metrics off this page. <laughs> I don't mean that in a bad way, but it would take three down to two. <laughs> you commit us, you know, it helps us have like <laughs> Yeah, the information overload is a part there. Uh, I did want to mention that in the resources of the usability section, um, we have three sections for resources, which are accessibility, discoverability, and accessibility. So we may need to update the resources there at the end, whichever one is pertinent to our um, discussions in that metric. Yeah, I, I tried to um, fix the um, um, uh, footnote numbering. Um, I, you know, I think at some point it broke. Um, and uh, I think last time that was the part that got my attention. Um, so, so yeah, so, so there, is a, there is a little bit of effort that has to go into making sure that numbered things are the things that were numbered. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if we did that, um, resolve that. I'm just looking at the first one right now, documentation usability. So here's what I'll propose. Um, Matt Snell, you and I get this out of a Google Doc and get it and get it into a PR, but at the same time cleaning up the resources section. Yeah. And we can just kind of make that available for next week's DNI call. You know what I mean? Saying that it's now in a PR and we'll do the full release, like the one month public comment period on it. Huh? Um, and that would be a good way to get feedback about our other metrics in this area then, right? Yeah, so then, so then we can, when we, um, announce it to the chaos list, we can say there's a new candidate metric in DNI that's part of that continuous release. And then to Sala's point, also stating in there that this is one of maybe several ways of thinking about documentation. Um, 
more to come. Would that work for you, Sala? Uh, yeah, I, I think that that's one way to go. And I think it's the more team oriented way to do this. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Does anybody have any other comments on kind of that approach? Simple, straightforward. Uh, and if we don't have any more comments, we may um, defer our updates to this metrics system until next time um, when we get those reviews. Um, and we also have another item in there, and we have about 10 minutes le or eight minutes left. So it's a good time to move on. Sure. Um, so we had the entry tr issue tracker inclusivity metric. Um, Looks like someone put this in here and yeah. opening up the document. Um, oh, it looks like a lot of people are already in here. <laughs> um, yeah, I just added it in, but it's a first draft. Um, so I'm not sure what the process would be. Um, but yeah, just like a first attempt. Yeah, this is a good thing for us to review in these last minutes. Can, can you tell us a little bit about what this is, Miriam? Um, yeah, so just pull it up there. Yeah. Um, so um, this is the issue tracker metric. Um, so I just added issue tracker inclusivity as a naming. Oh. Um, and um, what I'm thinking for the description is um, is um, a way to almost like um, quantify how affordable the issue tracker is uh, to multiple types of contributors. And this really could be whether you're a newcomer, whether you're just like an occasional contributor or a core contributor, you'd find something to work on. Um, and that being said, it would be with um, also being able to differentiate issues um, with different skill sets, like what would you need to work on this issue language wise framework? Is it front end or back end or documentation? Um, is it like code or non code contributions? Um, so some of the things I thought could work for that would be um, a newcomer friendly uh, issue tracker. Um, so one that has defined um, like um, issues that are newcomer related like good first issue or newcomer friendly issues or easy first issue um some wording like that um one other thing i just heard about recently is that there's a mentor available tag or label um which would be pretty interesting for suggesting issues for newcomers that have um, a mentor attached to them. So you can ask them questions. You, they would be processing the PR. Uh, so they're basically there to walk you through the process. Mm -hmm. um, issue list diversity would be more like um, having issues that are different. They could be documentation or code. Um, usable title and description, um, basically a way of um, of making sure the title and the description are well structured, readable, and I feel like they're going to just follow the guidelines of uh, documentation usability mm -hmm. um, and um, a consistent usage of tags um, or, or of labels. Maybe I should stick with that wording. Meaning um, tags of the same family should have the same color. Um, um, each family of tags should have a different color from another one. Uh, just to make them visually distinct. Um, and yeah, and I think this might be doable, pretty much all of it by just uh, mining software repos. Uh, so it shouldn't be too hard to implement. Yeah. Super interesting. There was a comment from Solana as well in the chat. Yeah, so um, this is looking an awful lot like the labeling taxonomy I'm trying to create for our platform. <laughs> <laughs> which is cool. Um, 
But uh, because of the fact that, you know, we don't have anything automated, blah, 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 I'm trying to enforce a bunch of different things through the labeling structure, um, especially in regards to get issues in GitLab, because it's so easy to create those Kanban boards, you know, where you can like drag and drop it through the process. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so this is looking like some of the different stuff that we're doing, like things that are features, things that are bugs, things that are the documentation, all of those different aspects. But um, I, I admit we are taking it further than that because um, I'm putting my marketing team on GitLab. <laughs> it, at IEEE, they're still using spreadsheets. It's all awkward. It's painful. And so I'm like, you know what? What we'll do is we'll start doing issues. And one of the things that I'm doing is similar to what Jerm was describing earlier. One of our projects is events, which basically means any of our volunteers can submit events that they either want to speak at or they would like for us to sponsor or et cetera, agnosium. And so, and then they have to go through this approval process in regards to if they want to be official IEEE, if they want to just do their own thing and have it be listed on the site, awesome, they can do that. Um, But if they want to be official, then there's like steps that they have to go through. And those steps are very similar. Um, The only thing that I would add that, or that we're adding to, y'all don't have to, obviously, is we are looking at um, the other types of role diversity in regards to that. So we are looking at things like brand ambassadorship, you know, for these people going and speaking on our behalf. We are looking at things like um, uh, design and architecture. So if they're going through and adding some assets in regards to like road mapping or um, the API constructs or, you know, anything along those lines, we're like figuring out how to come in and give them more credit than they've ever gotten in the past. Because one of the difficulties I see that happens in open source is if it's not a line of code, we don't count it, right? If it's not a, if it's not a line of sentence and documentation, at least now we're starting to count those. Um, I want to count all the other stuff. And so that's why I'm like horn shoeing <laughs> things in kind of a little backwards. But um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm loving uh, seeing a lot of this. So thank well, you. And that's why we go through the same process for documentation and code so that it, everyone has what we call an active technical contributor, whether it's a doc contribution or a code contribution. And that's why I was asking about the us versus them because we Mm -hmm. don't have that because everyone is an ATC if they have anything committed. So one of the things that we are looking at, Amy, is measuring those, the pages and the other ones as well, right? So not just limiting um, our measurement to the other tools. It's like, yes, the measurement's easier in the other tools, but it's not always where we want people to be because trying to draft a document in that from the start is really hard. Um, And basically they've rebelled against me. They're not going to do it. Um, But they have, because they did find it to be so difficult. (laughs) They were like, hey, once something is completely stable and we don't want it to change often, then we'll put it in there. So um, that's been the interesting, you know, uh, uh, user experience from doing that. So, uh, yeah. But like I said, for me, I'm trying, and and I know that y'all can't do this, and that's one of the reasons why we're, you know, investing in this, is so that we can actually create something that can measure all of the different types of role diversity that it takes to make a really good community. Um, So... Well, we appreciate you sharing that. Um, it looks like we've gotten to the 10 minutes before the next hour. I think we had a really good discussion today uh, and we've gotten a lot worked out. Uh, so I appreciate that from all of you. Um, thank yeah, you for that. I just, I did post one thing in the issue tracker inclusivity for Miriam, just as you're thinking about this metric, kind of where you think it might be positioned so we have a spreadsheet that kind of tracks our metrics. So if you could take a look at that, that would be great. Mm-hmm. So then in listening to you talk and listening to Salona talk, this is this is a lot about um, kind of tagging or labeling the issues themselves and, and thinking about that. Not necessarily the tool of issues, but the the, the process by which you create issues to um, Recognize good work, I think is what Solona was talking about as well, but also create a, a place that's approachable for others, if I was understanding it correctly. Okay, that's super interesting. Yeah, and, and I know it's like too much for y'all, right? I mean, I know that it's like, you know, GitHub doesn't have it, have 
fun getting that into GitHub when they're not giving you any permissions. I'm like, that's why we adopted GitLab and that's why I'm trying to actually work something out between us and get, you know, between IEEE and GitLab so that we can create some specialized interfaces. Cause we're even talking about doing a special instance that would focus completely on academia yes. and understand them and their processes and make it easy and usable for them. We're still having, you know, that granularity that code has and it's code versioning and all the wonderful stuff that GitLab has in regards to that. So yeah, I totally understand that what I'm talking about is like woohoo, way out there. Oh no, no, <laughs> it was spot on. All right, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, it looks like we've reached the end of our meeting here. Um, and thank you all. Um, we'll see you next week at the DNI meeting and we'll have a big badging update for you, I think. Okay. Great job, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, have a good one. Take care, all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Okay, see ya. Bye.